Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. The general framework that John Rawls is elaborating in his book, A Theory of Justice, can be extended beyond just the narrow confines of discussions about distributive justice and uh, brought into the field of moral theory or thinking about ethics more broadly. And he talks about this uh, a good bit early on in the work and other people have taken his ideas and extended them to ethical decision making or deliberation or moral judgment more broadly. So we should think about what the implications of his work is and what he in fact has to say about it. And so the place to begin is actually in chapter three. This is very early on in the work and he's talking about why he calls what he's doing a social contract or contractarian view when there actually isn't any moment of contracting. It's kind of an abstract hypothesis that's going on. And so he says that um, there may be an objection to the term contract and related expressions, but I think that it works reasonably well. Um, to, uh, to understand it, one has to keep in mind that it implies a certain level of abstraction. In particular, the content of the relevant agreement is not to enter a given society or to adopt a given form of government, but, and here's where we see that there's some very clear ethical implications to it, to accept certain moral principles. So the entire discussion, whether we frame it in terms of contract or contractarianism or whatever terminology that we're using, it's not about creating an entirely new society. It's about evaluating currently existing societies, policies, organizations, groups, and thinking about them from the basis of several moral principles that he thinks we ought to be accepting. So he says, the undertakings referred to are purely hypothetical. A contract view holds that certain principles would be accepted in a well-defined initial situation. So he is providing the well-defined initial situation, actually in the very first few chapters of this work, and then he's refining it through the rest of it. And what is that? It's an initial condition of all of us making judgments about what society ought to look like under a veil of ignorance. And then in his view, coming up with these two basic overarching principles of justice that, that govern the way in which we uh, create the rest of the society. So like I said, it, it's about accepting certain moral principles. And he says that there's a good reason to pick this, this term of contract. It, it's evocative or connotative of certain things. He says, the merit of this terminology is that it conveys the idea that principles of justice may be conceived of as principles that would be chosen by rational persons, so that's one proviso, and that in this way conceptions of justice may be explained and justified, right? So he says, the other thing that, that is really good about this, that we should find attractive, is that it deals with the fact of us being within a society that where we don't have complete agreement already. He says, Principles of justice deal with conflicting claims upon the advantages won by social cooperation. So by virtue of existing within a society or a matrix going beyond, say, just the family, 
we are involved in social cooperation. We have roads, for example, because somebody actually built them and that required uh, paying the people who were building the roads to, to put them through there and the surveyors to actually decide where the road ought to go and how far it can go this way and that way. And then there's upkeep and all of that requires, you know, a lot of social coordination. And there's plenty of room in there for competing interests. So he says that... Um, these principles apply to the relations among several persons or groups. And the word contract is an apt one. Why? Because it suggests this plurality as well as the condition that the appropriate division of advantages must be in accordance with principles acceptable to all party. So he says um, this is, is why we want to use the word contract. The idea is that when you have a contract, there is some mutually agreed upon uh, arrangement that everybody may not be perfectly happy with. They'd all like to get a bit more out of it, but they can, they can say that they've been consulted. They've been brought into it. So that's important. Uh, well, that's why we're going to use the term contract. Now, justice as fairness or this contractarian theory that he's putting forth, he says, is in some ways just the tip of the iceberg. And he says that it's not a complete contract theory. This is also in uh, chapter 3. Why? He says, It's clear that this contractarian idea can be extended to the choice of more or less, notice the term that he chooses here, an entire ethical system. So what does he mean by that? He, he clarifies this in very Kantian terms. Uh, he says, a system including principles not only for justice, but for all the virtues. That is, for all of the dispositions to behave and be motivated in certain ways. And it would also thereby include the vices, things that you shouldn't do. And this is indeed what Kant himself does in the metaphysical, uh, the metaphysics of morals, which includes the metaphysical elements of justice on the one hand, and the metaph metaphysical elements of virtue on the other hand. So Rawls is actually following a well-established path in making this distinction. And you could say, if you want to be very, speak very broadly, well, we've got, you know, society and how we ought to arrange things there. And we're not so worried about motivations in that case. And then we have the whole realm of personal life and relationships and our own actions and motivations. And so contractarianism, of the sort that Rawls is elaborating would in fact extend to that were we want, going to want to develop it uh, that, that way. So he goes through a couple things talking about how we would extend this. And I think we can think of three different things. There is, as we just mentioned, extension to virtues, extension to our own particular motivations or those of other people. Uh, we could think about it in a Kantian way, the maxims by which we regulate our actions. We could think about it in other ways as well. But he, before we get to that, he says that even rightness as fairness hasn't been adequately conceptualized just in talking about justice. He says that um, I'm going to consider only principles of justice and others closely related to them. I'm going to make no attempt to discuss the virtues in a systematic way. A next step, he says, would be to study the more general view suggested by the name rightness as fairness. And, you know, we might even think, you notice one word that he's not using there, we might even think goodness here is part of the virtue thing. Then he has another really interesting suggestion. He talks about extending this even further uh, to embrace other things, he says, this wider theory fails to embrace all moral relationships. Why? Because it would seem to include only our relations with other persons. What would it leave out of account, as he says? Animals and the rest of nature. Animals are not persons for Rawls, but we could still think about our comportment towards them. So we could ask ourselves, you know, whether factory farming would be, uh, comp you know, uh, compatible with the moral system that he's laying out here, drawing upon this uh, uh, notion of contractarianism. And probably the answer would be no, but we, we would have to carry out uh, a sort of 
reasoning process about that. And, and there could be two sides to that. It could be that it's bad for the people who are involved and they can't reasonably agree to it, uh, given all the different things that, that go along with, with factory farming. But we could also talk about it being bad for the animals themselves, even though they're not considered persons, or for nature, the environment, in a broader sense. So this is, uh, at least in its core, it has the potential to be a much broader moral theory. Um, a little bit later in the next chapter, he talks about um, the reason why he's, he's uh, still talking about contract, and, and he says that it's a hypothetical. And so he says, it's natural to ask why, if this agreement is never actually entered into, we should take any interest in these principles, moral or otherwise. And that's, that's a good question. Isn't he just doing sort of a abstract parlor game here, playing around with ideas, engaging in a certain kind of utopianism? Rawls thinks that the answer to that is no. By outlining these principles that will never be fully realized, we are providing ourselves with the skeleton of a moral theory, which he takes to be, uh, in some respect, a exposition of our moral sentiments. But here in, in chapter 4, he says, the answer to this question, why should we take any interest in this, is that the conditions embodied in the description of the original position are ones we do in fact accept. So, again, this is a fairly standard move in outlining a new moral theory. You say, listen, I'm just kind of clarifying what it is that, that decent human beings already do believe. I'm trying to provide some, some uh, articulation here of, of something that you see that, you know, the utilitarians doing this. Even Aristotle does this to some extent, right? So Rawls is doing a well-established move here in saying that these are, these are principles we should accept if we really think it through, if we're thinking about it in a objective, unbiased way and not worrying about whether it's going to raise our taxes or, you know, let our neighbor, uh, you know, have better stuff than us. If we're, if we're really thinking it through as a, you know, rational beings, then we will accept these principles. But he's got another thing that he says after this. Or if we do not, then perhaps, no, notice that word perhaps, we can be persuaded to do so by philosophical reflection. Why? Because each aspect of the contractual situation can be given supporting grounds. So if you don't already accept this, it's, it provides a sort of way of a leverage, a, a rhetoric for reaching people who don't buy into justice as fairness. So you, you could, for example, use this to try to convince people who are uh, racists for sentimental reasons that perhaps racism is not the way that they ought to go and shouldn't be regulating their moral decision making. Right? So the original position and, and the principles that he derives provide guidance for moral theory. And he does have a discussion about moral theory in uh, chapter 9, which is some remarks about moral theory. A lot of this is concerned with what he calls reflective equilibrium, so I'm going to keep this, this discussion here focused on the parts that are not really uh, looking at that. Early on in that, he says that um, when we're engaging in moral theorization, he says, let us assume each person beyond a certain age and possessed of the requisite intellectual capacity develops a sense of justice under normal that's the key word there, normal social circumstances. We acquire a skill in judging things to be just and unjust and supporting these judgments by reason. We ordinarily have some desire to act in accord with these pronouncements and expect a similar desire on the part of others. And he says, this is very complex. We're not going to try to get into the complexity. But he says, we may think of a moral theory at first, and he says, this is a provisional view, as the attempt to describe our moral capacity. Or in this present sense, my theory, the, the theory of justice, is describing our sense of justice. And he says, what we require here is a formulation of a set of principles that when they're conjoined to other stuff, our beliefs and knowledge of circumstances, would lead us to make these judgments with their supporting reason if, and here's another key, we were to apply these principles conscientiously 
and intelligently. So Rawls is not saying that his theory of justice describes how people do in fact behave. Much of the time, people are not behaving that way. There are many problems with this. He is saying that if we are being conscientious, diligent, rational, that this is the moral theory that we would accept so that it's not just a theory of justice, but actually more broadly speaking, it could provide an entire ethics for us to regulate our moral decision-making and evaluation and development. 